I'm ready. Okay. So first things first, let's see that shirt. Let's, let's, let's peep that, that prototype. <laughs> that is sweet. Anything on the back? Oh, nice. Oh, and then they got the, the Pletcher spread all out. It looked like, right? Yes. Yes. It's, yes. It's pretty cool. It's like techno a little on the back, like a little modern retro and then LP. That is a cool, I like, it's uh definitely <laughs> really cool. I like that. Yeah. And it's a, you know, we don't talk about the enemy that much, but I mean, obviously <laughs> Rudis, you know, they're not really the enemy, but uh, it's a competing brand with Barbarian, but I, it's a nice shirt. It's a nice shirt. Okay. So let's talk about Luke Pletcher. Luke's not the enemy. Luke's not the enemy, you know? Okay. Okay. <laughs> but let's talk about, so the, just in your eyesight, if you lean a little bit to your left, there's a lot of stories being told what's in the picture here. <laughs> we got a nitty lion behind you. We got a Luke Pletcher shirt on. Hannah Mears, what, what is your deal? You are confused. I it seems what's going on. Are you a nitty lion or are you a Buckeye? What's going on? I'm super indecisive, right? No, come on. I'm always a Nittany Lion. I am diehard Penn State, but I would cheer for Luke Pletcher. I always cheered for Luke, even before we were we were together. Um, he was from Lake Trobe, so, you know, it was cool to follow the guys from high school um, that you supported. So I, I supported him as a Buckeye, and then um, now I sort of have to be a Pitt fan, too. So it's kind of crazy. I'm like juggling a bunch of different hats, but Penn State's always got my heart. I mean, come on, I'm, I'm an alumni. How can I not? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it, everybody, it's just like when you see the Ohio State fan base, because I'm obviously in Ohio, uh -huh. and then my wife's from Ann Arbor, Michigan, so I see that side of it too. My wife went to Pioneer High School, which if you look at the big house on a, a map, on the Google map, uh -huh. the big house and her high school are directly next to one each other. Like, so if you were standing in her parking lot where she went to high school, Pioneer High School, uh -huh. literally they used to park there. Like 30,000 huh. fans used to park there because then there's a golf course across the street where a lot of people park and they tailgate in the golf course across from yeah. the big house. But she grew up and she said, watching the games as a little girl, you would hear, you'd see something on TV, but you'd hear the crowd seven seconds before because right. it was on like a seven to 10 second delay. That's you funny. hear the crowd. And I was like, that is so cool, you know? And that is cool. That's cool. Yeah. And that was from her house. So she would hear the crowd from her house. I mean, as a crow flies under a mile where she lived in, in her school. Like a sports fan. I don't really know what does. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, the, always the, the big question for whenever I meet these kids who leave, who leave, like, I think Bozak, Steve Bozak, I think that he might be from like state college. Mm -hmm. Right. That always intrigues me right? Like my wife's from Ann Arbor, right? Uh, Rayvon Foley, who wrestles for Michigan State, went to the same high school as my wife, Pioneer High School. I'm so intrigued whenever someone leaves that area, whenever you leave State College or you leave Ann Arbor, it's kind of mind-boggling. The Columbus people are the biggest ones. Yeah. Uh, Le'Veon Bell is from South Columbus. Mm -hmm. Le'Veon Bell went to Michigan State, right? So like, that's another one. Like, I'd love to ask him, why'd you, why do you leave? Why? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because you normally, the kids don't leave those places. Like our number one recruit in Ohio right now, the number one junior, junior is this kid named Seth Shoemate. And he's a freak. He's won everything. He was a state champ as a freshman at 195. And his school's 10 minutes from the Ohio State campus. Uh -huh. So that's a no-brainer is going to Ohio State, right? And then we had the number one recruit in the country, this kid named Connor Brady. Connor Brady went to the same high school as Lou Roselli's kid and Tom Ryan's kid. And he goes to Virginia Tech. Yeah, so I'm like, that stuff like blows my mind. <laughs> no, yes. And I'm like, I think that's the most appropriate question ever. Someone it is, but like, I bet, I bet some like weird things would happen to it. I can't remember who I was talking to about it, but Luke was telling me there was a kid, I want to say on Pitt maybe, and I, I don't know why I'm blanking on the name. It was something we just like briefly talked about, I think this summer and like, chose the school because they said they had a good ice cream place nearby so like I would love to talk to people and be like wait what's really the reason you committed because <laughs> so like you never know Zeb maybe there was a cool like pizza shop they'd rather just be near you know yeah I mean my brothers wrestled two of my oldest brothers wrestled for Ohio State my brother Chad and my brother Ferd and my brother Chad's obsessed with this place that just closed called Catfish Biffs and it was like on the campus it was like not great pizza and grinders but i'm guessing it would be like one in the morning two in the morning drunk food 
so I think, oh man, this guy was obsessed <laughs> with catfish biffs. And I remember having it like a couple times and I was like, this is pretty underwhelming for all the shirts you wear and how much right? you love it, right? I'm just, just like, like that, like everybody there probably knows about it. So like, yeah. that's a thing. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's crazy to think about like, but why kids, you know, go where they go. But okay, so did you and Luke go to the same high school? We did, yeah. So I went to Mount Pleasant until about seventh grade. Eighth grade, I transferred to Lake Trobe. Um, and then I was at Lake Trobe the rest of my high school career. It was awesome. Um, Mount Pleasant sort of where the foundation of like wrestling was in my family and stuff. And now like, live and breathe everything Lake Trobe. So uh, Luke and I did go to high school together. We were in the same friend group. Uh, I did the wrestling manager thing for a little bit too when I wasn't playing basketball. So, so yeah, we have our paths have crossed. <laughs> okay, so you were a wrestling manager. Are you the same graduation year as him? Yeah, we graduated together in 2016. Wow, that, that is wild. Yeah. The other wildest thing about all this is how young you guys are, you and Luke. <laughs> I, I talked to him, I did uh, – some press with him before the, the habit matchup. And it was funny because Dave Habit was in the NCAA finals when Luke was a junior in high school. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I love, I think it's so funny looking at that. I think that's one of the coolest things about like the sport of wrestling is because the age gap is, is crazy. And I know that's in like other pro sports too, but I feel like just because you have an individual versus an individual and someone can be like 30 and someone's 20, like that's the age gap that's funny to me is like that head to head matchup. <laughs> Yeah, and the other one is like, so Mark, uh, Mark Hall, when, as Mark Hall was growing up, everybody used to give him shoes, I remember. So Mark Hall and, and Dave Habit used to come to our camp. I worked, Mickey Burnett, Mickey Burnett's on the pit team. Uh -huh. Mickey Burnett's dad's one of my best friends, Eric Burnett, and I was the uh, mat mopper and the toilet plunger for like 15 years <laughs> in this camp system, okay? So Dave was from our camp system. And Mark, Big Mark, brought Little Marky. Little Marky, they came in this little beat-up truck, and they drove down. And Mark, Big Mark Hall sat on the mat. And I remember when Mark Hall was uh -huh. seven or eight years old, coming to this camp, getting the tar kicked out of him. And I remember just thinking, I'm like, this kid loves this, right? Like, and the dad loved it. And it was like, they drove down from Flint, Michigan in this weird truck and now i'm like you gotta understand mark was six seven years old and i'm in my 20s and i feel so old now and You're dave for age them oh my god i'm 41 and i'm like oh my god i'm so old i remember when mickey burnett was born i carried mickey burnett's got a pinball machine in his basement uh at his mom and dad's house i carried it from their one house in Illyria, and it sat on my thighs for a half an hour while they took the legs off of it Oh my gosh. Yes. And it was like, You're a warrior. yes. And I was like, man, I want that pinball machine. And Eric's like, yeah, it doesn't work anymore. Cause his dad, Eric was an all American at Clarion. Uh -huh. Eric, that's one of the best guys you'll ever meet. Mickey's a, a great kid, but like, it's just crazy to see like the age, you know, cause Dave Habit, him and I yeah. talked about it on his, uh, his pre-match uh, interview. And he was like, I remember when you woke, woke me up, they slept through the run, him and the Simon Kitsis kid from like, yeah. Massachusetts. They slept through the run, and Eric was like, run them. Eric Burnett was like, run them and make them carry dumbbells. <laughs> well, then I was running with them, and eventually I was like, guys, th their hands started to bleed. I was like, you yeah. got to ditch the dumbbells. You might get a lawsuit for something. Yeah, like and I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, I mean, not, not now. Oh, now you would, not then. But, but right. uh, so, you know, I go way back, obviously, with the Burnett's. But tell me about your family, and, and it's funny. You call it Latrobe. Yeah, I know. I know. I don't think there's a real, like people say Latrobe, people say Latrobe, but I feel like everyone that's gone to the high school says Latrobe. Um, I feel like that's just how it comes out because it's like all the chance, everything is like, we are Latrobe, like things like that. Um, and like my freshman college professor and I had like a conversation about it. And we actually had one class that was about like Arnold Palmer and like the, his the way really? he branded himself yeah like mike Foreman has a class at penn state and like one of our classes was literally on arnold palmer and like his golf legacy but also like the arnold palmer t and then like how he branded himself and basically became like even more rich than just from you know being an amazing golfer so he brought in arnold palmer t's then to the class because i was from latrobe and we always talked about latrobe latrobe so that whole lecture he like said latrobe um for me like corrected himself it was really funny but yeah. yeah, so I went to Lake Trobe, 
Um, and my, I mean, my dad coached wrestling me my entire life. So that's sort of where it was born. Like the name Bleacher Baby, like I was there 24 seven, um, from him coaching. And then, uh, my brother wrestled, my cousins wrestled, like every guy in my dad's side of the family, at least has probably tried wrestling. At least they've had to try it. That's almost like a rule to be like a mirror's boy. It's like, you at least have to try it like one time. Um, I'm pretty sure is like how that works. And, um, I've done it, you know, like I haven't wrestled, but like we had a gym and like a training center down here. And so like, I'd go down with my brothers on the mats and like, I would wear singlets. Uh, I was never like allowed to wrestle. Didn't really care to either, but um, that was, that was sort of my side of it. And then my dad had to stop coaching when my little brother was born. I just like, it was just too hard of a decision. We were like 10 years apart, my brother, my older brother and I, and then my little brother. So, you know, that he just came along later. Um, my dad had to quit coaching. So then still was around it though. Cause my brother wrestled. And now here we are like this money um, years later and I had an arena hosted for Penn State Wrestling, like covered it, um, get to cover these events with Pitt now, which is cool. And then my dad's coaching again. And now here's my little brother. He's going to start wrestling. Um, so it's, it's just like really cool. That's just how our family's always been. It, wrestling has been family to me. It's all I've grown up with. Like my dad's wrestlers were here as much as my family members were growing up. Like they were my brothers, the guys that walked through here, they'd come swimming here. They played basketball. They lifted here. They trained here. Like they wrestled here. Um, they'd come and like have dinner here. Like it was just all I knew growing up. And then my dad coached um, school boys and cadet teams as well. So um, some of my like best memories were made playing wiffle ball with those guys while they were training to get ready to go to like Florida or Indiana or wherever those events were held at the time. And uh, it's funny seeing like the Cruz brothers grow up and I remember them like jumping on my trampoline when they were like 12 and they were trying to teach me how to do a backflip. And like, I don't know if they remember that stuff, but like, that's what I remember growing up. And Jordan Oliver was like pitching a kickball. And um, then my dad was, and he was like telling jokes to my dad. He's like, we want a pitcher, not a belly itcher. And like, those are the things I remember is like, that's who I remember Jordan Oliver as this like really funny kid. And like, with this crazy curly hair and like the Cruz brothers on my trampoline. And so like, no matter what I was going to do in life, I knew wrestling would follow me like somehow. <laughs> so you, the, these kids are all around you. And those guys, like you talk about elite guys, you know, there's people who are like guys like me, mm -hmm. like a, just kind of a regular guy. You probably remember and see people <laughs> like that around just like, you know, normal wrestling people, like maybe guys at state yeah. place or state qualifier. You still remember all those people too, you know what I mean? Like you remember the elite ones, yeah. right? Like I bring up Dave Habit and Mark Hall, right? Those guys are NCAA mm -hmm. finalists, all Americans, D1 guys, and you know that I, there's I have hundreds of examples like that of guys that like have just come around since they were yeah. little at the Bernats, and it's just like it's mind-boggling to see people mm -hmm. when you meet them, and then what they later go on and do. It's it's like an awesome thing. I love it. It's yeah, like, yeah. It's I'm glad really that that's awesome. That's, yeah, yeah. Really, um, really cool ties to have for sure. What was the school that your dad coached at? Is where you've transferred from, right? Um, so my dad coached at Mount Pleasant. Yeah. So he originally he coached at like Kiskey Prep for a little. He coached at Latrobe for a while as an assistant, and then he was at Mount Pleasant, and that's when they won some like Whitfield titles and um, things like that. So and you know had state place winners, and um, he had a state champ in Donnie Amit. So that's sort of the era I remember growing up is the Mount Pleasant era he coached. And then it was sort of all about my older brother and I in sports. And so my dad walked away from coaching for a while. And now that he's back, it's cool because I get to see um, the school I graduated from and these kids who are, I mean, they're so much younger than me, but I was watching them in JOs and like Luke's brothers on the team, which is really cool. And like my little brother will be in junior high. So it's just cool to get to see now like another era of wrestling come through and like knowing my dad's coaching and it's what he loves to do. So it's cool to see him back doing it again. And we were like sitting down watching wrestling, talking it the other day when um, the pit match was up. So it's just kind of cool that no matter where life has taken us or drifted us away from the sport, like somehow we're always brought back into it one way or another. Okay. So Latrobe, if I'm saying it right, <laughs> from, from Latrobe to state college, uh, were you like a person who wanted to do Ivy league? What took you to, to state college, Pennsylvania? Why state college? Why do you want to be a ninny line? Um, yeah, that's like funny too. Uh, 
I didn't know I did. That was the only school growing up I wasn't allowed to go to. It was brainwashed in my head that you were not allowed to go to Penn State. Like, we don't like Penn State. Like, my, my dad went to, wrestled at Lock Haven in college. So Penn State and Lock Haven back then were kind of a little bit of rivals. Um, and so he was very, like, you're not going to Penn State. Um, my mom went to Pitt. So, like, she was all about Pitt. And I wanted to play soccer somewhere and major in nursing. And I was going to go to Waynesburg play soccer, major in nursing, and train in, like, boxing in the offseason, um, because my soccer coach, like, that's what she did in the offseason was, like, box for training, and I was, like, that's awesome, like, I'd love to do that, um, but there was something that was just, like, so off about it. It seemed like a choice I was making because it, it seemed like it was the right thing to do for my path, not necessarily what I wanted to do, like, something still felt like it was missing, and so I remember my cousins coming home one day, and my uncle, and they were like, you need to go see a Penn State football game. You need to go visit a big school before you make a decision that, like, is solidified. So I was like, fine, whatever. I'll go to a Penn State game with you. So I went to a Penn State football game with them, and we just tailgated. Like, they just took me around town, and we tailgated. We didn't even go in. And actually, Vincenzo Joseph and Jared Cortez, like, met me at the tailgates um, because Vincenzo and I grew up really good friends as well. And they stood there and told me, like, all these reasons why, like, I needed to come to Penn State. And so again, like wrestling brought into that decision. Um, but I was like, no, you're right. Like, what am I doing? Like, this is just like, this atmosphere is so me. And like, at one point I told my mom in high school, like I wanted to go to a big sports school. I wanted to go to a big like football school. Like I wanted to have that experience because that, those are the things I liked. So I went home that night and I applied myself, like paid the, the way in and then like went into the living room to my parents. I was like, hey, by the way, I applied to Penn State. And my parents were just like, what? Like, that's so random, but okay, like, your decision. And then a few months later, like, we get the acceptance letter. My mom went so crazy because she was excited. She brought it to school, pulled me out of class after she had already opened the letter and even, like, sealed it back up so it didn't look like it um, and brought it <laughs> to school. And I opened it and said I was accepted. And ever since then, I mean, it was, it was su such fate to end up there. Like, I never would have pictured it, but, but it was great that I did. Okay, so you said nursing was what you wanted to do. What did you actually major in? <laughs> Broadcast journalism. <laughs> okay, that's very not the same thing at all, no. Hannah. No, not at all. <laughs> so I, I, I looked, I looked. Anatomy in high school. So you did like, so yeah, <laughs> you had to take anatomy and cut up a dead cat because you yeah. thought that's what you're going to be. <laughs> I did. <laughs> yes, that's crazy. Okay, so you covered football. Do you have to cover every sport whenever you go to and you get into the journalism school at Penn State? No, like, so Penn State offers a lot of internships, right? But you have to, like, seek them out yourself. They're there. They're available for every student. Um, but in my, one of my freshman classes, that professor I had talked about, he sent me an email um, because I went up and, like, introduced myself, told him what I wanted to do, like, what I thought I wanted to do because the summer going into my freshman year of college, I um, assisted ESPN at Steelers training camp and I got to shadow some people. And like, that's when I really fell in love with broadcast. I was like, okay, something here is telling me like, this is what I need to do. So when I talked to my professor about it, he sent me an email and he was like, Hey, athletics is looking for this position. I thought it was just like a, an intern where I was going to either be getting some coffee every day managing their schedule or like writing a bunch of things I had no idea but I was like absolutely I'll do anything so I go to this interview and I realize I'm sitting through something to like be an on-camera talent and I was like oh no like I have no idea what I'm doing or getting myself into at all but of course I was like yeah absolutely sign me up and so that's when that happened and it turned into just covering like extra content at football games to sideline reporting at basketball to in arena hosting at wrestling covering some lacrosse events covering you know other things on football soccer like whatever you can imagine like I was trying to get my hand in and so once you're in like a position within athletics like you have an option to cover just about any sport there which is awesome yeah I mean it, just talking about being on camera talent you know I always make the joke I got a face made for radio um <laughs> and that's fine I'm okay with that but like you know, someone like you, you're a real journalist. You went to journalism and broadcast school. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, I'm looking, I have a couple of degrees. I have like a master's degree in science for teacher leadership <laughs> and a uh, bachelor's degree of science in adolescent education. I'm a teacher. Yeah. How does someone like you who's a professional journalist feel 
about when there's just like kind of hacky type people <laughs> who are doing it. You know what I mean? Like I, I do it. It's, it's something that uh, Martin Floriani pulled me into it. If you don't, Martin Floriani, the godfather. Yes. The, yes. The, star, the guy who started Flow Wrestling. Um, I gave him a ride um, from the 2007 uh, University Nationals. And he fed me this crazy pipe dream. We're going to be the biggest thing in wrestling. And I'm like, yeah, right. You're nuts, dude. He stunk. He like literally stunk in the, in the sense of I could smell him. <laughs> um, and he was traveling and sleeping on floors and he was a super driven person. And that's what got me into it. Cause this guy sold me yeah. this pipe dream and then he rolled back up into Ohio and he slept on our floor and he was just like a fanatic and he filmed wrestling all day. Everybody thought he was crazy because he's talking yeah. into the camera and it's like now what I'm doing. Yeah. And it's like, but how does a person like you, Hannah, feel about like not, not journalists acting as journalists? Yeah. Well, let me just tell you one thing. I'm a emergency certified COVID substitute at a school. So I guess I could reverse that question for you. Um, <laughs> because right now to make money, that's what I'm doing. Schools need help with teachers and substitutes with COVID and everything going on. And I love kids and it's been a really humbling experience for me to see you know where kids some kids backgrounds and how different people learn and the way you can observe people and listen it's it's just been a really good life lesson for me um more than anything so I guess I could flip that question on you but honestly I don't I don't get bitter about it because in my field what I've learned more than anything is it's yes you get a degree yes you get certifications but the people who hustle hard and network are the ones who are successful so like if you want to be successful in this industry like Find where your niche is, go all in at it, work hard at it, believe in yourself and like network to the right people and you'll be successful. Like people that I've talked to so far, like no one really asked me what my degree is. They look, they're like, what have you done? What can you offer us? Where's your experience? And so graduating from Penn State too, that's what they told us. It was like, how much can you take from the university? How much can you do here and gain experience? So I don't get like bitter about people like you because I admire your hustle because I was doing things in college that were really demanding to ask of a college student sometimes too. Um, but I, I just have respect for people in the industry, no matter what your major is, whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman, a teacher, like whoever you are, um, if you hustle and work hard, like you can do something you're passionate about and sports and talking to people is something a lot of people are. So I think it's really awesome. Uh, I just respect people who work hard and go after what they want because ultimately that's how I want to be viewed. So, so I respect it. I respect your hustles, Zeb. Okay. I like that. I enjoy that. First off, <laughs> I totally embrace that you're helping schools out because of the shortage of substitutes that like, I'm all in on that. Like, the, yeah, thank you. As a matter of fact, yeah, you're welcome. But my thing is, and here, here's my like first actual interaction with you was and I've probably seen you at like NCAs or something and maybe never thought anything of it but uh, did you work with Pat Penn State Pat uh, did you go to any NCAs and work with Pat yeah so I I didn't go to I went to NCAAs as a spectator and unfortunately because of COVID I was actually going to be the reporter sent to cover Penn State Wrestling and Nationals no in 2020. Way. yeah so Ugh. That, that one hurt my heart a little bit but I my heart goes out to the guys that missed that more than anything but yeah so that's what was supposed to happen, but I did work along Pat with Pat um, at Penn State for in arena hosting marketing stuff. Okay, so here's the I'm already putting it out there. I don't <laughs> care if Pitt or Penn State, if if anybody is crazy enough not to pick you up, you will be credentialed under Go High Ocast. You will I be, love it. <laughs> you will be rocking the G O H I O and you will be out crushing interviews like you do. That's, that's what I'm, I'm just put, I'm not, this is not just like gimmick on my, like on camera stuff. Thank you're you. hired. You're hired. So, <laughs> so, okay. Ooh, my parents are going to be thrilled. No. <laughs> but my thing is like, yeah, if you ever, if someone, I mean, you're going to be there, trust me, but if they have a tournament, but here's what <laughs> my interaction with you was, I'm doing, I doing my thing. I'm going around just getting as much interviews and content as I could at the, the Pittsburgh wrestling PWC one. And I keep feeling in my peripheral, you know, my, my sides, <laughs> there's someone standing over my shoulder and I've only ever had this experience like once or twice. Um, this guy, <laughs> this Cuban Haslin Garcia was messing with me in like California. I was doing uh, interviews in like uh, orange County and he was standing over my shoulder, like messing with me. And he's like, he was a coach at Arizona state. Uh -huh. And I'm like, I think he's Cuban, but Canadian, whatever. 
and I, he, he just made me laugh and I turned the camera yeah. on. It was funny. You were like <laughs> poaching information and I was like, Who, what is going on? And then eventually after like a second or third one, I was like, hey, is everything all right? And you're like, yeah, you're like hey, Anna, how are you doing? And I'm like, okay. Then as I'm doing the broadcast with Nico Magalutis, you started handing us handwritten notes <laughs> with information on individuals. And I'm like, this person is like a dream come true. What is going on here? What is happening? What, who is this person? <laughs> Who is this? What is it's happening? You, and, are I'd, you? <laughs> and I'd seen you like before with like some Penn State stuff, like in passing. Uh -huh. I never thought anything of it, but I'm like, oh my God, she's a savage. <laughs> she's an absolute savage. She's in my, she's, wow, what is going on? You, I don't think anyone's describing me as a savage. You're a savage. Yeah. Like I came home and was talking about you to my wife. I'm like, this girl is like, like, She's a driven junkyard dog savage. I'm like, she wants information. She knows everything. She's really good at doing interviews. And I'm like, eh, she's awesome. And I'm like, eh. and I wrote you. I like immediately wrote you a thing. I like wrote, um, I was like, you're killing it. Thank you. That, no, I mean, you, that means a lot. You were just hustling though. And I love it. I love it. I I'm really like, glad you didn't turn around. <laughs> I'm really glad you didn't turn around and be like, what are you doing? Like, this is my material, but like my mindset for everyone's background. Okay. Like you're making me sound like I was like over your shoulder. Like, Hey, like, no, 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 like, no, 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 no. That like, <laughs> wasn't that at all. It was, I got pretty good peripheral vision. Yeah. Right. You were, you were eight feet away. You were social distance. You were eight feet away. You weren't even six feet away. You were eight feet away. My thing is you were like, it was going up here. You yeah. wanted it. You wanted the information. You wanted to know more. And that's what I really appreciate. And then it showed in all the post-match interviews and everything I've watched that you've done with Coach Gavin. You're so observant. You got a wrestling mind. The sad thing with someone like you is, and this is what I was telling some people, like I think in my wife, I was like, this girl, someone's going to, NFL is going to pick her up. Uh, Jared Upper, my business partner, who I normally do the show with, old business partner, college teammate, great guy. And he's like, yeah, someone will pick her up to be an NFL sideline reporter. It won't even, yeah, it's going to happen quick because I just couldn't believe how much of a student of all of the information you were. That was just, that blew my mind. And you weren't poaching my information. That, that, <laughs> you were, you're you're no, hungry good. for it. You're, you want yeah. it. You want to know. You want to be the best yeah. you can be. And I love that. And the hustle, you know, yeah. I, I could go on some crazy generational rant about your, your people, <laughs> kids your age. Yeah. But like, you just don't That's see not it. how I grew up, I promise. Yeah, I've, it's, I've had a job since I've been like 12. <laughs> it's just different. So now, are you just doing Pittsburgh Wrestling Club, pit type stuff, or are you doing teaching? What else? What does Hannah Mears do now? What is Because the, there's 24 hours in a day. I'm guessing you only sleep about six of them. What do you do with the other 18 hours? Yeah, um, that's yeah, so funny. I like, that's something that's like been really hard the past couple months is like, that whole like job search thing. It's like, where do you go? And like, for me, I feel like I already didn't take a traditional route. And there's so many options out there, especially because people, when you talk to people who want to do like sports journalism, everyone talks about football, basketball, baseball, like hockey, like the four, you know, main things to get into. But like me, I always said, the first thing I tell people is what I love most is wrestling. And I would say everything else, I love and of course everyone wants to be on an NBA sideline of course everyone wants to be at the NFL or NHL MLB something like that but like wrestling has its awesome thing that like I've always felt family with and a part of so I always said if I could be involved with that someday like that's pretty much a dream job for me that's awesome um but what's hard is like being 23 and out of college everyone's like why don't you have a full-time job yet and it's like well we're in a pandemic but also it's just like really hard to lock myself into something when i can do these really cool things right now so fortunately westmoreland sports network offered me a job um so i covered high school football all fall and high school soccer which was awesome so i did my first ever color commentary for high school soccer and i got to cover my um my alum you know lake trove which is really cool i played soccer there and then football was awesome. I got to go to the state championships and cover Jeanette, um, which is huge in Westmoreland County. Jeanette football is like a coven there. Like it's, it's everything. You live and breathe it if you live in Jeanette. And then- yeah, I live with Michael De Palma, I know. Yeah, <laughs> like live and breathe it. Yes, and, he was and, on the football team with, like it was, with it Terrell was, Pryor. Yes, it was 
amazing. So like that was really fun to be a part of. And all those guys now that I've talked to and like they probably thought I was the creepy reporter being like, hey, can I call you and get information? Now they're the first ones like favorite my tweets. Like even if it's not about anything like football, they're all like go Hannah, which is really cool. And so Westmoreland Sports Network is what I'm doing. Unfortunately, wrestling's been, you know, shut down for a little bit. So or else we would have been getting into wrestling coverage. Uh, so I'll be doing stuff with them hopefully continuing to do stuff with Pitt because I, I really love doing that and um, thank Keith so much for letting me be involved as, as much as he did let me do that which was awesome. COVID substitute teaching so that takes up my day from like you know 8 a.m till 4 p.m every day. So Every day? Are you, are you in the classroom every day? Yeah. Is it a K-12 license that you have? What do you have? Uh, I don't have a license. Oh, you don't have to have a license. Okay, you got to have a, a substitute license. COVID substitute, you, you have to pass all your clearances. Got it. But you're essentially just there. Like a lot of things people wouldn't know in a school right now is like when the kids are there, they can't eat lunch in a cafeteria. So like they need lunch monitors. They need people to just like pull kids out and get one-on-one -on -one instruction because you can't do small group because you can't get in groups. You have to distance. So there's a lot of things like that or like when a teacher is out for, you know, COVID, at least in our district, like, and they're out for two weeks, they need someone sitting in the classroom just being a body in there for kids. So that's sort of been my role. I've been in um, some learning support classes as well. And I've just really loved that atmosphere. So that's what I've been doing every day of the week. And then um, next week, I'm starting this thing uh, with this guy who his name is Raj, and he's starting up a, a podcast, essentially, and asked me to be his host. I went through like a little interview process. And it's really cool because it's something I'm also passionate about. It's about branding yourself and marketing yourself. And it's not just, you know, personally, like that's the biggest thing I want to take from it. But it's about helping small businesses rebrand themselves where they don't have to shut down and things like this. It's uh, branding and demanding. And it's going to be called the Demand Academy. And eventually it's going to turn into an app that's going to be like having a, a CMO in your pocket. And he's an investor, a lawyer, like has all these super sick things he's done in his life. So to even have him consider me as someone that could have an educated conversation with him um, is awesome. So I'll be starting doing that next Tuesday from one to three. Every Tuesday, we'll be recording a show and putting it out uh, and see where that goes from there. And then anybody else who wants to throw some things my way, like I'm, I'm here. So <laughs> well, you already know you got a credential. You already know where to go to get your credential for the... Uh... And all you got to do is be a savage like you are. Just be you. You know what I mean? Go, go gather the interviews like you do. And it's, I, yeah, I was like, this person is into this. <laughs> I was. Well, because it was the first ever, believe it or not, it was the first ever wrestling event I ever got to be Matt side for. And so really? for someone who's grown up with wrestling, like that's a huge opportunity. I, the last thing I wanted to do was blow it. Like, first off, Keith had a lot of faith in me. I convinced this Josh Burt that like I was going to do a good job and like he didn't have to have me there you know that was his production essentially too um so like the last thing I wanted to do was blow it and like asking a wrestling sideline is is a lot harder sometimes than football you know it's not just x's and o's and catches and touchdowns and things like that like that match is really complex and like we saw at Pitt like some of those matches changed in the last second so you can't just like prepare your questions for that like you have to be so ready for anything because those matches can change so quick so it was a big challenge for me and I, I didn't want to blow it because that's an avenue that I'd really like to be in one day and I don't ever want to say I want to be the wrestling girl and not be able to be that yeah I mean if you look at just like the Werner match Werner mm -hmm. and was it Newell who was who oh, New yeah was it, they're wrestling and Newell is controlling the match yeah the until time. late in the match and then Werner hits him with a big lift and pins him. Yeah, and pins I mean, him. The first match of the night. I'm yeah. like, wow, what a way to start it off. Great, yeah. And, and then the, the Matthews match. Yeah. That was the one that was even more. Like, geez, the last 20 seconds of that match went both ways. Like The, the last 10 seconds of the match, Cole Matthews won and lost the match. He won it yeah. and lost it in the same 10 seconds. And that, that's just, oh, that's Cole Matthews. That's par for the course on yeah. that one. He's wild, yeah. man. He's yeah. wild. And, uh. Yeah. It's I love so Cole, though. I love Cole. What a yes. guy. Oh, yeah. I'm a big fan. Uh, yeah. But, like, Bonacorsi getting uh, re revenge on Stefanik. Yeah. You were just so you, – you, yeah, I've never seen someone so on with it, and it was really cool. And then had to be the, the, the cherry on the top. The last <laughs> – you get to interview your boyfriend, Luke Pletcher, yeah. right? How <laughs> awesome was that? It was cool, but I was also, like – 
if anybody goes back and back and watches that video, like you see him walking over, like smiling. And I was like, Oh my God, like, what is he about to do? Like, I hope he takes me seriously. Like, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to have to be like, thank goodness I had a mask on. Cause I almost started laughing. Cause he looked at me and almost started laughing. And I was like, no, like rein it in Luke. Like we're getting this done. Like you're not about to ruin the last <laughs> interview. Uh, but he was really professional about it. And then at the end was like, Oh, thanks Hannah. Thanks Hannah. But no, it was really cool because not only like, yeah, he's my boyfriend, but he's someone, you know, I went to high school with, I respected watching him. It was fun watching him. We've been really great, great friends growing up too. And then seeing all his success at Ohio state and then knowing how much work he's been putting in to like really study who he is as a wrestler right now and where he wants to be in his life decisions right now. Like, especially after everything that happened with nationals, like I really admire where his mind has been able to be and like how he's been able to grow. So being able to be the one to like ask him that question after a big victory like that, it felt really good because it was very authentic and it was coming from a place of if I'm not asking him that now, like I'm asking him that later, you know, when we're eating pizza. So, so it was just, it was a really cool moment for sure. So were you two dating last year when he wrestled at Ohio State? Were you guys dating last year? Yeah. So when he won the big 10 championship, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but yeah, actually we were, we started dating last December, but we were like together since like last July. Okay. So he loses a match in the dual meet. <laughs> And it wasn't really close. He, I mean, he got him. And, you know, Luke would tell you that. I was like, he, he got yeah. you. He goes, oh, yeah, he got me. And then how he came back and, like, just changed the result in the big time yeah. final was – I was so impressed. My yeah. wife loves him. She thinks he's like – she's like, hey, Tom Fletcher, I love his style. And, and she <laughs> said, that's saying a lot because I'm from Ann Arbor. You know what right. I mean? And that's like if you you love a style or you love how someone wrestles or you somehow you love how they carry themselves. And yeah, he was just like a huge fan of him, even when he was cutting a ton of weight. And, you know, and yeah, I, I liked him. You know, my favorite version of him was well last year when he won the Big Ten. But version point five of him was when he was a, 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 the wrong weight freshman. Yeah. <laughs> totally the wrong way just who he is is like a person though too like there's a lot of guys who won't make that sacrifice for a team because yeah. it's hard and like luke would never be that person that just wouldn't make that weight like he was tiny skinny like i guess he's short but like he's compact so like he yeah. was sucking weight like hard and so it was also nice to see him finally get like the respect he deserved his senior year too because he was at a natural weight like he felt good. He was confident in himself. And yeah, it was really cool to see that. Of course. Okay. I'm saying when he was a freshman, yeah, <laughs> he went in at 141 and he was not a 141 at all. No, he was tiny. He that's was like, when he should have been at 33. Yeah, yes. That's when he should have been at 33 when he yeah. went 41. I, Keyshawn Hayes or someone got hurt. I believe yep. it was what he said. Yeah. And I was like, dude, what you did. And I think he was two, two and two or three and two at nationals. And I was like, mm -hmm. this guy is good. Yeah, this guy is really, and I was, yeah, I was always really impressed with him. But my wife, huge Pletcher fan, Sarah <laughs> Miller, huge Pletcher fan. Trust me, huge, huge Pletcher fan. Huge LP. Huge yes, LP. huge LP fan. I have to get her a shirt now. Yeah. But um, so you know, you're in the situation where you're at Penn State and you're dating an Ohio State guy. How weird was that? See, like everyone thinks it's weird. I think the reason it wasn't weird for me was because like we went to high school together and like we had dated in like eighth grade for like two weeks. And then I, I think he it. broke up with me because of wrestling, which is really funny. <laughs> um, so like we were everyone always our friends, like our friends always joked with us like, oh, you guys will end up together, blah, blah, blah. But I just don't think it ever like lined up right. Um, so then when it finally happened, it, it like didn't even the Ohio State Penn State thing didn't even like really mean anything because we just felt like it was meant to be. Um, but once I went to Ohio state, like Colin Moore, like introduced himself and I was like, hi, I'm Hannah. And uh, he's like, Oh, where do you go? And I was like, Penn state. And he's like, oh, okay. Like I'll talk to you later. And just like walked away. And like, so, so like, that's where it started getting really funny. And I went there for like the Penn state, Ohio state games and like wore all my Penn state stuff. And, um, so there wasn't like hard feelings, but there were always digs at each other. Uh, but also at Penn state, when I think Luke was wrestling, um at the bar we made the bouncer like put on the ohio state match and everyone was looking at the screens every tv was like this because i was really good friends with the bouncer and i was like we have to put on the ohio state match and all my roommates and i are there like watching luke in a penn state bar and everyone's like why is there an ohio state wrestling match going on and we're like going nuts <laughs> and like so there was a lot of things that probably crossed the line of penn state ohio state but 
we have fun with it. It's a good rivalry. <laughs> okay, here's the big thing. A healthy rivalry. <laughs> okay, were people mean to you in Columbus? When you would go to Columbus, were people mean to you? That makes me sad if they were. Actually, no. People, no, people weren't mean. I went during Penn State, Ohio State the one time, and of course, you're going to get the digs. But, like, no one was mean to me. If anything, people, like, would joke about it and then be like, ah, oh, I have a beer. Like, you know what I mean? No yeah. one was, no one was mean about it. And um, then, like, his roommates and I ended up getting along really well. Um, Clay Reagan and Elijah Keery, Cleary and Colin Moore, Gary Traub, um, Grundy, which is Ethan Smith, went to high school with me, too. We call him Grundy back in the day. But uh, he went to high school with us for a while. So all those people ended up be being people I really enjoyed being around. And in a way, a lot of their personalities were really similar to the guys at Penn State that I was really good friends with. And so I kept joking with them. I'm like, guys, if you ever met like my group of friends at Penn State, like you guys would get along so well. And so eventually when Luke was able to make a trip to Penn State, like we hung out with like Nick Lee and Chenzo and Luke Gardner and, you know, the guys I was friends with at Penn State. Uh, which was also funny because I'm like close with Nick Lee and then that's who like Luke wrestled. So then they ended up becoming friends and like Chenzo and Luke have always been friends from like back in the day. But you know, it's just like cool to like bring them to your environment too. So there was never like, it was never like hatred between anyone. It was just always little jabs at each other. Okay, good. Because I'm not going to lie to you whenever I see Steelers fans, because you can see this Browns head, I'm yeah, sure. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, you guys own us. I mean, if you looked at the <laughs> record, it probably is not very favorable. Some of our guys didn't even travel. But. <laughs> it's true. They didn't even, you guys didn't even play our starters. But, <laughs> <didn't even> talk. <laughs> but, and the crazy thing is we lost our defensive end, not Miles Garrett, but uh, Olivier Vernon. He tore his Achilles, I want to say, in the fourth quarter, and he sacked. Awesome. He had a couple sacks. He's really good. He had a nice tackle for a loss. He is excellent for us and a, and a veteran. And we lost him playing your backups. And I'm like, but, you know, I'd, I'd be hitting you with the, here we go, brownies, here we go. And hoo, hoo, I'd be hitting you with that. I, it would be left. Or, I mean, I know Colin Moore would. I know Colin Moore. Colin Moore's a Northeast he Ohio He gives me crap about it all the time. We have, like, conversations and, like, Instagram posts about it sometimes. I love it. It's funny. I love it. The old – the old Wayne yeah, County like Strangler. Yeah, the old Wayne County Strangler down there. He's the rudest guy. He's the rudest guy. A model, as I said. Yeah. But um, you're a savage. You're a junkyard dog. Where do you see yourself in five years? Oh, God. Hopefully employed, huh? Um, <laughs> that's a, it's a hard question. Um, I would like to see myself I'd like to see myself stable. I guess it's, it's such a cliche answer because I don't see myself doing something super traditional. Um, I would, I would love to say that's the route, but like, I really like where I am in Pittsburgh right now. Um, I like being close to my family. Um, and I love that Pittsburgh offers a lot of different types of sports. And I love that I could be close to wrestling where I see myself in five years, where I'd like to see myself would be, I would love to be on camera covering sports in an area that I'm very happy with. Um, and it's really broad because every year that I keep finding myself in journalism and keep realizing what's out there, like there is so much more than I ever imagined. So it's really cool to just be super open-minded. Like, I don't want to just say like, I'll be hosting a game show or I'll be doing this because there's, you know, I could be making a full-time living hosting a podcast, which is crazy to think about, you know, you get it. Like, it's crazy that that's an option for people. Um, I would love to host a game show though. That'd be cool, but that would probably be some 10 years. So is game show, like, is game show like, like the public, ultimate goal? I think that would be something where I, I think I'd be really happy. Like a college game day would be sweet to me. Um, I, I would think I would love something like that or some sort of show on a network. I like the vibes of that. I like how it's very like conversational. It's fun. It doesn't have to always be, you know, like serious conversation. And it also mixes that perfect blend of what I like to do in my journalism of finding the cool content, like, you know, like digging for those little feature content stories that also relate to the event itself and mesh together. So I think that would be something that would be a really, a really cool dream job for me is somewhere where that find, I find the perfect blend of that. So I had um, Mark Amarico once on a couple weeks ago and he's one of my college teammates and him and his brother are two of my really good friends. Uh, Mark lives in Georgia and he made a sculpture for Shaquille O'Neal. Get out. Yeah. He made Shaq's, uh, there's a, uh, a 
back, basketball backboard and all these rims. He made the sculpture. Mark once made the sculpture on Shaq's. How on, big? How big did that sculpture sculpture? It's in? massive, sculpture. and it's a bunch of backboards. It's like ten backboards, and he sent me all of it. And he camped out at Shaq's for a week and did it. And him and Shaq goof off, you know, like because yeah. Mark's little. Mark's five foot tall. He's, he's shorter yeah. than Luke. He's little, little, right? Uh, and him and Shaq would wrestle and goof off, and him and Shaq are buddies. And we had him on, but how he got, he was on a show. He was on all the uh, HGTV, yeah. on all these uh, uh, treehouse monsters. He's no way. All the different treehouse shows, yeah. And then he's, he's on all these uh, HGTV ones, DIY network. He's on all these shows. That's sweet. Yeah, and that's how Shaq got him, was from one of the producers. He's like, oh, yeah, we got Mark Wentz. Mark Wentz can do anything. And it's Amerigo Glass and... I actually got a piece like right over here. I have his first sculpture. Get out. He you threw it on the curb. Stuff like that. He threw it on the curb and we were in this podcast. It's right behind me on a, in my garage, right behind me on a, right up here, literally like right there. Oh his first God. sculpture that he did in sculpture one at Kent state, they threw it, they put it on the curb and I went by and I, of course I'm a scavenger yeah. scrounge. Uh, I took it and it's, he, he made a plaster base with it. And I have it. It's this gold head. And, he, and I took it and I brought it in because the garage is right here. Yeah. And he was like, I've never seen. He was like, oh, my God. He's like, that's one of the first sculptures I ever did. That's and I remembered cool. it. That's cool. I like that's catching. So cool. Good for you. Yeah. And I, I just, well, I love Mark once. But like, yeah, but that's someone sick. like you who's like on the way up, it's like the best thing ever. The best thing ever, and to see. I hope so. I hope I'm going up, and I'm not like slowly gonna hit my peak, and then right there. You're you're trending up, Uh, but my thing is like, yeah, just like in talking to you and watching how diligent you are, uh, how driven you are, and then the professionalism. It's just yeah, like my thing is I'm. It's very. uh, I like the fact that someone like you isn't offended by my like lack of journalistic, uh, not integrity. Because I, I have integrity and I ask honest questions. But the fact that, like, you know, you know, because I, I could see how, like, because I remember when we first came into this, like, in 2008, mm-hmm. they were just like, oh, those guys, they're, they're not real journalists. That was a thing yeah. that, that they would say a lot about, uh, like, Martin. And then I was with uh, Joe Williamson and Mark Bader. And they, the first coverage Mark Bader ever did, ever did was he flew up to Ohio and we went, Phil Davis fought. We watched Phil Davis's. We covered Wait. Phil Davis's first professional fight. Pause. My first ever interviews. My first ever interviews ever in Beaver Stadium. Hundred and seven thousand screaming people. I'm like a little sophomore and huge wrestling junkie. You know, of course. My first ever interviews were when the Bellator MMA fights were in State College. Ed Ruth and Phil Davis on the sidelines in Beaver Stadium, my first ever interviews. Like, how crazy is that, that, like, the wrestling world brought that as my first interview? So not only am I super nervous because my boss basically said, we're going to throw you out there, sink or swim. If you're bad, we're getting rid of you. If you're good, we'll keep you. But, like, I have to interview people that, like, I looked up to, that I thought were cool. And, like, everyone's like, yeah, Ed Ruth and Phil Davis. I'm like, do you know who they are? Like, do you get this? Like, this is big for wrestling fans. And so I was, like, nervous. I don't even think those interviews aired. I don't even know if they were good. All I know is that was my first interviews ever, and that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> I love it. That was the first. Uh, 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 it was the first MMA fight that I ever covered with Bader. I know that much. And it was the first uh-huh. cover I ever did with with Bader. And then I had like it was cool. I would uh, periodically run into Phil Davis. He was super cool, man. Yeah. Really, 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 really nice guy. Crazy thing about him, I brought him up in the uh, Keith interview before the PWC one. He was not a state champ. Keith was not a yeah. state champ, both NCAA champions. How about that? How about that? Yeah. How about Pennsylvania high school wrestling? I mean, it's not even up for debate. It's not up no. for debate. What's the toughest it's state? Not. And, and, you know, we've had that in Ohio. We have Brian Dolph and I think one other Brian Dolph mm-hmm. won it. He trained with – he was Dave Schultz's training partner at Fox Catcher, and he was NCAA champ in Indiana. Mm-hmm. But, like, he, then Keith rattled off, like, three or four other ones, and I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh my God, Pennsylvania is so deep. It's wild. But yeah, yeah I just love hearing 
the junkyard dogness of you and, and why it is what it is. What, who do you think was the biggest influence? It sounds like your dad. Is your dad a teacher, by the way? Yes. He taught What's special education. And then now he's the, he was the athletic slash transportation director at Lake Trobe. Now he's just the athletic director and wrestling coach. Got it. Okay. So he's an administrator uh, yeah. and a coach. Okay. So he's the athletic director. Wow. Yeah. So is, is that the big division, by the way? Is Lake Trobe in the big division? Yeah, there's so many now, though. Like, around here, there's, like, 5A, 6A, this, this, this. And we were. So, like, sometimes we float. So, like, we're not, like, the biggest. It's, like, maybe one or two below sometimes, depending on enrollment. But we are a bigger division, yeah. In wrestling, you're – is it AAA, I believe it's called? Yes. AAA. AAA is the big division. Like, yes. Easton's oh, AAA. So wrestling, yes, yes, yes. AAA is Easton, Northampton. They're yes. all they're all like AAA. bigger schools, yeah. Reynolds is AA. Reynolds is double A. Uh, LaBeouf's double A. Yeah, like most of the Pittsburgh. Mount Pleasant Pittsburgh, was double A. Yeah, yeah. And Mount Lebanon. Uh, what's what's the one? North Allegheny. Those are all triple A, right? They're triple A. Yes. So North Allegheny is the biggest school in in PA, isn't it? I believe so. It's yes. massive. I mean, it's like, like to, to, my, to my knowledge, I don't know all the statistics on it and how much anything's changed, but yeah, what at least when I was growing up, they were graduating classes of like thousands of kids yeah north allegheny's massive because and that's because that's where tig moore is from that's where jake herbert's from geez oh pizza there's more i can't think don Corey's, jesse yeah, rogers yeah, like yes. that's my era of those guys yeah yes there's yeah. so many really good people and that's wexford right i think so yeah it's what it's north yeah because it's north yeah. of pittsburgh but it's just crazy to like see and hear like your story what's the what what would be a defining moment in wrestling for you that like something your dad did your brother did what what would be like something that really sticks out to you that they did that really drew, like grew your love for the sport um so the way that my dad made wrestling family was definitely the first thing that you know that you loved about it so he wasn't just like a coach to a lot of these kids like at Mount Pleasant he had like sometimes like a rougher group of kids who were kind of like firecrackers man like you didn't know what they were going to be doing like some of them were getting into fights like friday nights like some of them like you just you didn't know about these kids sometimes but they were great people you just had to have like the right person pull it out of them you know and these were the kids i grew up with as like i had a whole team of brothers you know they'd be like at my house like i said all the time and like they'd like be respectful like growing up we had wrestling camps and i'd be making like pb and j's with my cousins like hundreds of them while my mom's making like chicken and fries and cutting up fruit and like we made the lunches for the camps like they the guys would come up and eat and like so that's all i ever knew it was like all summer it was camps all winter it was wrestling off season it was training and then there was like you know the school boys and things like that so i think the way that like wrestling just meant family to me like if i saw these guys in the street like today, like they're still like my brothers, like my dad's state champ, Johnny Amit is like my brother till, you know, forever. Like he, he was literally living with us for a while. So, um, in the way that some of them, if they had trouble cutting weight, like they'd be living in our basement for a little bit. Like that's just how it was growing up. Like it was normal. So I think my biggest influence, like from my dad was just like how wrestling was family. And like, no matter who those guys were, like they respected him and they respected us as family too. So like, that was really cool for me, like to have those types of guys you looked up to as an athlete, but also just like they treated you like family too. Uh, for my brother, it was his senior year. He was training uh, probably harder than I've ever seen him train before. And he was a heavyweight. So like to see him put in like that much extra effort, like it, it finally showed me that like, okay, like he really wants this. And all he wanted was to be a Whitfield champ that year. It would have been something like exactly 20 years I think from when my dad won a Whitfield championship that like he did like there was some weird storyline there and I knew it was going to bother him for like the rest of his life if he didn't like make that story come true so I was getting up with him at like 5 a.m and uh I played three sports too so like I like to train like that stuff I like to do but it was like new for me to like do it with him more and we were doing pool workouts and he was throwing like medicine balls at me as I'm like treading in a pool and I'm doing the same for him and we're tying ropes to ourselves and we're swimming out and my dad's timing us. And then he's practicing after school and lifting. And then like to see his Whitfield championship dream come true. And like the final seconds of a match, he was on bottom under Isaac Reed in this match. And he reaches up because like he couldn't get out. Isaac had a leg in and he reaches up, grabs Isaac head, brings him down and pins him from like the bottom position in the, the default. Hit him with a default. And it was just like, 
the craziest moment and it made me feel so good because it's like something we trained for together it ended up being a huge moment for him and my dad and uh it was just like really cool to see like all the work he put in finally pay off and I think I you know that's where you see like the grind of wrestling that people don't usually see and the background of it and like I, I've grown up a three-sport athlete but like no one trains harder than wrestlers like those guys are not just training hard, like they're sucking weight while they're doing it. They're going without water, like food, like, and they're still doing it. And like half the time, everyone's like, why am I doing this? Like, I hate it. But at the end of the day, they all still want to win and be great at it. So I think there's a lot of things that go along with it. But those are two moments specifically that like, I definitely appreciate about the sport. How did your brother do at the state tournament? Mm, he pl- he placed a couple times that year. Two brothers, multiple, a, a big school division state placer in, in PA. Yes. In at heavyweight. Yes. Did he wrestle in college? He went to Colorado School of Mines for two years, and then the injuries on his shoulders, he just kind of called it quits and came back and played football at St. Vincent for a year, and then just completely stopped sports. But have yeah. You, have you been to Golden, Colorado? I have. He actually oh. lives there now. So he lives in oh. Nevada, but yes, Colorado oh. is beautiful. <laughs> Golden Colorado is right. It's west of Denver. It is off I-70. Mm-hmm. It is amazing. Yes. Oh, yeah. Wow. Those places are so cool. I love going to Colorado. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. You'll have Man, to hit up his so restaurant cool. when you're down there. He, he manages a Santiago's down there. It's a Mexican, authentic Mexican restaurant. It's Wait, delicious. where? Where is it? In, so... Fred Fredericksburg, Colorado. Frederick, Colorado. That, your brother's still out there. He just moved. We moved him out there this summer. Luke, Luke, me, my mom, my little brother were in one car. My brother and his best friend were in another car. We road trip to Colorado to move him out there. Wow. Yeah, I was there last summer. I was there last summer. So were uh, we. When were you there? I was in, it was 2019 when I was there. Uh, when were we there? Jeez, let me look. We I was there. June 2019 for me. Oh, this was, we were probably there around the same time. Maybe it was July. Hold on. Yeah. So we, okay. We were June, 2020. Okay. Yeah. So you are a year later than me. Yes. You were pandemic moving. Yeah. Seriously. You're pandemic moving. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. I didn't have a choice, but yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. You got to do it. Uh, Okay. Do you have anything else for me? Do I have anything else for you? Well, I know that, I know that before I let you go, what's the podcast again? Where we're, we're like, going to be able to see, where are we going to be able to get a weekly dose to Hannah Mears? So it's Hear Them Out with Hannah Mears. So wait, and say, say it slow. Say it slow. So my podcast right now is Hear Them Out with Hannah Mears. A lot of the earlier content was based on wrestling. So you'll love to see those. That's where you get some really cool stories. Um, but I'm coming out with something new. I want to rebrand a little bit, make it a little more casual. Um, I have a videographer in Pittsburgh who we worked together at Penn State. Like he was my, my guy that did everything with me. We're like partners in crime. He's now in Pittsburgh, which is awesome. And we are starting a new show. This is my official drop of this too. I haven't told anybody about this yet. This, called, we got the exclusive? Got the exclusive. All it's right. Called, it's called Beers with Mirrors. And so on the podcast, I'll be enjoying a beer from a local brewery, trying to support some small businesses out here. Uh, having a conversation with whoever it may be. We have some guys lined up and uh, just trying to have a fun conversation. You know me, like to just sit there and, and hash it out, see what comes out of people. So it's going to be cool. It's going to be fun. Beers with mirrors. Uh, stay tuned. I don't know all the details yet, but uh, I'll give you the, the little low down there. Okay. So you're going to shoot me a link to the old ones. Yes. Hear, hear the mat. Wait, say it again. What is hear, it? hear them out with Hannah Mears. I, okay. I need links from that. Is it on YouTube? Well, how can I hear that one? Yeah. So that one's on YouTube. It's also on Apple, Spotify, and Anchor as well. As um, well, all of these, as well, Barbarian Hour with Hannah Mears. Awesome. <laughs> but yeah, I recommend going to YouTube because we have like the faces of guys on there. So uh, I've done some with like Anthony Kassar, um, the Hydley brothers, Luke and Gary Traub, which was a fun one, Mike Kemmer, uh, so the, Vincenzo and Nick Lee, like there's a bunch of them on there. So yeah, definitely go, go check them out. All right. I'm going to promote this. I'm excited about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> awesome, Hannah. Thank you for the time tonight. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we got, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk to you a little bit after we, we cut off here, but I, yeah, I appreciate it. I love the work ethic. I love the, uh, the you. driven junkyard dogness of it. Uh, listen, dog. Do you want to know, which is why it's funny. You call me junkyard dog. When I was growing up playing soccer, 
I was really little and I was playing with a division two years older than me because of just the way my friends were playing. And I had a nickname. They called me dog. And it's like so embarrassing now looking back. But like when I was little, I was like, yeah, I'm dog. And like, I got shoes on them that said like dog mirrors, like D-A-W-G mirrors. Like I was, I was that girl. Like I was such a boy, but like, yeah, that was, that was the coolest thing ever. So yeah. Junkyard dog. Look how that came back to haunt me. Huh? <laughs> I love it. I love it. You, well, I gave it, I think Cody Walters, I've called him a junkyard dog. He wrestled for how you, <laughs> he was just like, just the epitome of just not a super talented guy, but he wanted to win where you have talent. You have talent. That guy was just, I don't know. Cody Walters has just got something in him. He's, he's a little crazy. The coach at WVU now, but um, he was the junkyard dog because the guy just found ways to win. Whereas you're a little more of a thoroughbred when it comes to the uh, journalistic uh, chops that you have. So Hannah, thank you for the time. I'm going to cut this, talk to you a little bit off camera. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Stick around here for a little bit. All right. All right.